Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Courtney Reyes and I'm with the Home Builders Association of Greater Kansas City. I'm also a member of the Northland Education Business Alliance or NEBA. Um, NEBA is a network of education and businesses, business organizations in Clay County and Platt County um, whose version is, or whose vision is to promote and provide business-driven educational opportunities for you, our next generation of business leaders. Um, I'll be your host during the session, but we do have two other NEBA members working in the background. Um, one is Miss Amy Washam. She's no with Northwest Missouri State University, um, as well as Adam Jelinek. Um, they will be helping us today. So just a few notes before we introduce our guest speakers uh, for this session. The session will run for 40 minutes with a hard stop. At 8.40, our industry experts will begin by sharing their professional history and insight, but we want this to feel more like a conversation. At the, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see an option uh, to use the Q&A feature. We encourage you to use that space to post any questions you might have at any point in the session. We might not be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best when the session ends. You'll be asked to take a very short survey. Please give us feedback on this, this event so that we can better get better at hosting things like this in the future. Last but not least, the session will be recorded and available on NEBA's YouTube channel in the near future. Okay, so let's get started. I'd first like to introduce Tiffany Moore. Good morning. Well, my background in the design and construction industry has taken a very windy path, uh, but I have enjoyed that and it's brought me a really broad range of experiences. I started out as a drafter and that's an aspect of the business that I still really, really enjoy. Uh, I still do it by hand. I like to use tissue paper and pencils. It's a very creative process for me. But after doing that for a number of years, I really was interested to understand how it all came together out in the field. I wanted to understand how all the things that I drew became real buildings and real um, highways and, and infrastructure projects. And so I went back to school and got a construction management degree and moved on into a variety of roles out in the field. Um, I eventually married all of that together into a facilities role. And I'll probably talk a little bit about that through various questions. But for me, that became sort of the central core of my passion. I enjoy creating spaces that enrich people's lives. And I know that sounds really sort of highfalutin and fancy, but it's really important to me, whether you're walking through a park area or down a sidewalk or going into a home or entering a school, that it brings something to you as the occupant that is living in that space, be that for the five minutes that you're there or for the lifetime that you might spend in something more permanent in your, in your world. But that's where I come from in this space. And hopefully the, that passion will resonate through the answers that I have, because I really do pay a lot of attention to how the spaces that we create in the built environment impact people's lives. Uh, there is no moment of any day uh, of your life that you aren't in a space, be that an interior space or an outside space that has the opportunity to impact your life positively or negatively. And that's where I get my get out of bed in the morning juices to make sure that that, that impact is positive. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tiffany. Sure. Um, and the other guest I'd like to also introduce is Brian Freeman. He's a smart home legacy. Hello. <clears throat> so I started my career uh, about 2005 and I started in the family business and that was working with my dad hand in hand in the custom home building industry. So um, really interesting, a lot to learn in that whole realm. I spent basically the first entire year just in the truck absorbing everything I could because here I spent most of my life up to this point ignoring my dad and his business and all that and doing everything that I was interested in. Well, now it's time to be in the real world and have a job. And so then I started paying attention. But anyway, started in that and uh, really got to see and get involved with all sorts of different trades. That's the one thing that's probably been just the most beneficial to me from being in the residential construction space is all the connections and everything you learn about all the trades that go into the home building process whether it's, you know, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, foundation, framers, and then all the suppliers as well. 
So there's just so many different um, avenues and things involved in the residential construction world. And even with folks like Tiffany with drawing, so when we're building people a custom home, we typically, you know, some builders will do some of that in-house and then some will work with folks like Tiffany or an architect to help people, you know, design and draw the home that they like. And then from there, oftentimes it goes from an engineer um, and then you can get it for permits and things like that. So there are just so many different avenues and people that you work with in this industry. And then lately, so anyway, I did that for five or six years. And at the same time, we had a couple um, developments going. And so these are where we are buying the land, turning streets, and now we've got lots. So we're selling lots and homes now. And so at some point in there, and I can't remember what year, but I got my real estate license so that I could work to sell our own properties. Um, and then from that, you get lots of opportunities. So if somebody comes to your subdivision to buy, then you have an opportunity to maybe sell their home, so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the world I live in. Everything residential construction is kind of where I am from development to selling to building and um, just really enjoyed it. And it's kind of a corny saying that we have, but it's uh, helping people love where they call home. That's really why we do it. It is very um, rewarding uh, when you get to the finish line and you help somebody get to where they want to be in life. So. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, just to kind of kick things off, will you guys kind of tell us what some of the most essential or transferable skills needed to enter your professions and kind of talk about that? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and, and we'll see if Brian agrees with me, but my top two are being really organized and uh, problem solving skills. Uh, this uh, the pandemic has brought to light just how fragile our supply chain system is and construction has been impacted as much as anything. Uh, so we have to adjust every single day. You start the morning thinking, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is where our schedule is. This is where our budget is. And then you have to, uh, you, you have to respond to the information that you get on a daily basis. So problem solving, being able to really balance uh, the um, impact to the, the, like Brian said, the, the finish line. What is the decision I make today going to do to that finish line and how does that impact the customer that I'm serving? And making sure that everything is really organized. Uh, construction is one of the only industries that has no uh, common delivery path. Every single custom home to Brian's point is different. Every hospital is different. Every school is different. We're not making cars. Uh, that allow us to standardize on models. Uh, most people actually don't like that in their built environment. They don't want their house or their building to look exactly the same as the next one. What that does to us as the professionals that deliver those items is make it different every single time we start. Uh, so those uh, the, being really organized and making sure that you can keep everything moving uh, on schedule and on budget is, is huge. Yeah, <clears throat> those are great points. And, um, you know, in our industry, there's a lot of software that helps people stay organized. Um, there's a product called Builder Trend that is tremendous. It helps keep, um, you know, the customer, the general contractor, suppliers and labor all on the same page. And I'm sure there's lots of different, you know, alternatives to that, but that's the one I'm familiar with. And then I think to your point, um, and I wrote down what you said, no common delivery path. We just call it craziness. You never know every morning you wake up and you're gonna put out some sort of different fire, right? So um, <clears throat> it's important to have structure, but you, like you said, you've gotta be flexible because each morning is gonna bring you a different challenge that you weren't expecting, so. But that also, I mean, in a weird way, is kind of the fun of it, every day's different, so. It's kind of funny that you'd mentioned that is because I figured that's probably one of the things that you guys love about your jobs um, is basically the fact that you get to do something different every day and that it's not, you know, necessarily boring and Absolutely. correct me if I'm wrong, because that's my next question is what do you love most about your job? And if you want to kind of expand on that, that would be amazing. Yeah, that's where that's exactly. So when I tell people, I said one of the greatest things about our job is the flexibility and even freedom working a lot of hours in this industry, but also uh, depending on where you get to in your career, 
you have a lot of flexibility too. And so I like that. And then I typically report to the office in the morning is the plan. And most mornings that goes to plan and you stay, you know, for a couple, two or three hours, returning emails and phone calls. And then you're out in the field and in the world the rest of the day. And you can't beat that. I love it. And um, now my wife gets on me because it also includes a lot of fast food stops, right? But that's that freedom we talk about. We get to get out and do different things. So not captive. I, I agree. That is one of the things that I liked uh, and probably one of the primary reasons that I went on to get that second degree. Uh, drafting is mostly sitting at a computer and I loved the process of creating those documents, but I really wanted to get out into the field. The most rewarding part for me is, is that kind of floofy statement I said earlier, but I really enjoy knowing that I have the opportunity to enrich people's lives through the spaces that I create. Um, that's just really the central thing for me is knowing how much of an impact the work that I can do, whether that is someone's very small work environment or something much larger on a civic scale that alters uh, the environment for an entire community of people. Those are all really uh, passionate elements of the process for me. That's amazing, Tiffany. I think that you know people don't really realize how impactful their space is on their lives until it changes. And then they're just like, what? You know, um, and just their moods and things. So I really appreciate that. And I, and I definitely can relate to that a lot. So now that you kind of got, you guys talked about flexibility, you guys talked about, you know, what you love about your job. And I think as much as we can talk about loving flexibility, let's talk about the most challenging thing with your careers and what that kind of looks like um, within that space as well. So a lot of times in life, things are a double-edged sword, right? So I would say that flexibility also brings challenges. Um, it's not very fun when uh, the drywaller can't get to your job because it's muddy or whatever. And then now there's a drywall shortage. Now your customer doesn't understand that or they do, but they're frustrated because it directly impacts their lives. They're living in a rental longer than they thought. So, I, and I could go on and on, but as much as I champion the flexibility, there's also this uh, degree of unpredictability that can be hard to manage sometimes, so. Absolutely, especially in this market. Yeah. yeah I would say that uh, in kind of in parallel to what Brian just said, we are responsible for delivering things that either an individual household or a public organization or a private company has given you a, a significant investment, be that their life savings for their home or some sort of um, large financial investment on a public or private scale to deliver something. Uh, for me, uh, I had a customer once a number of years ago who said, I need you to manage my disappointment. I want this. It does not fit in my budget. Help me understand what I get, what I can have. Uh, walk me through this process. The, the most difficult, most challenging part of the process for me is to bridge what's in your customer's mind, in their mind's eye, to what you can deliver and get that as close as possible I am absolutely positive that Brian has also heard something along the lines of, oh, I didn't think it would look like that okay. uh, in the process, right? <laughs> because oh, yeah. we, we have this vision of what it is that we do every day. We understand exactly how it's going to turn out. And if you are building a home for a brain surgeon, or in my case, building uh, a workspace for someone who is going to um, make metal parts, they have no idea what you're talking about or how you're going to bring that to them. And that process, connecting the dots there is both incredibly challenging and rewarding at the same time. Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, so that reminded me that you kind of have to be flexible per customer. So you have to be a little bit of a chameleon. You're gonna have some customers that are really uh, going to want a lot of detail and be very analytical minded. And so you've got to provide that for them. Yep. Then you're going to have others that don't want any of that, but they want you to show up on the job site and walk around with them and just make them feel better. So you kind of have to, at least in my experience, it serves me better when I can kind of get a read on that personality type and deliver what maybe they're expecting. So Real customers don't go away at the beginning of the one hour TV show and come back at the end and fall in love with yeah. the space, right? <laughs> right. That's, that's 
super funny. That's very relevant. Um, okay, so cool. Talk, t let's talk to some kiddos and some people about what kind of certifications and um, that you guys might suggest or need if you're in your field. I know we talked about the skill set a little bit and, and what they would need, but talk a little bit more in depth about, I know, Brian, you'd kind of talked about you've got your realtor's license. There's all these different components. And I know, Tiffany, you said that you've got your degree in um, construction management, but let's kind of talk about that and, and how it um, impacts your daily life and um, just suggestions that you might have for those that are going into this industry. Sure. I, I suspect that Brian and I can give you two independent sets of, cre of credentials on the Absolutely. commercial and, and residential side, which will probably be helpful. On the commercial side, sustainability has been a very big part of the industry for quite a while. I would say when I started working on sustainable projects, we were at the beginning, we were uh, uh, beginning to introduce changes in the way we build uh, uh, facilities. Now, many of those processes are standard operating procedures, so it's less about uh, checking the boxes and filling out the forms and more about delivering what we know to be a, a good quality building. But the credentials with the USGBC are still really important for folks who want to demonstrate cutting edge uh, um, sustainable building processes. There are also a couple of other uh, sustainable organizations that have similar credentials. Um, there is also lean construction. Uh, that's a, a, a process that I'm really passionate about. Lean construction begins to apply some of the standard procedures from the manufacturing world to construction activities to the best we can. Uh, we certainly aren't going to get to uh, the same level of kit of parts that the manufacturing world can, but some of the processes like the last planner system that brings um, information up from the folks in the field into the planning process is uh, a process and, and a credentialing system that I'm really passionate about. There's also an, any number of credentials related to specific building types. Uh, the Joint Commission has a credentialing program for folks who want to work on hospitals. Hospitals themselves are accredited by the Joint Commission. So if you're interested in healthcare, that's an avenue you could, you could pursue. Uh, and then there are all kinds of similar credentials for very niche commercial markets that have very specific building requirements based on what it is that they do in those spaces. Yeah, so um, for me, what so I have a real estate license and then I had a builder's license. So those are the two things that I've obtained, I guess, during my career. Uh, the builder's license is based on the code book. It's the international code. And I can't remember what year it was now. <laughs> Forgive me. But basically, uh, just to give you a little bit of what that's like, if you want to get a if you want to get a builder's license, you have this big, thick book and it's an open book test. So, yay! but it's still I found it difficult because there's so much specific information. So they have classes and things to where basically all you're doing is getting familiarized with the code book and how to read it and where to find things. Um, then you're in pretty good shape once you have a grasp on that. Um, but with that comes uh, 40 hours of continuing education due. Courtney, do you know, I think it was every four years or something, but now I'm not sure what that- Depending on uh, which side of the state line you're on, I think on the Missouri side, it can accumulate. You have 36 hours that you need 36. to get over 40 years. Or not 40 okay. years, I apologize, four. only four years. Yeah. So, um, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. And then on the real estate side, uh, there's a, each state has a pre-licensed course. It's a two week course where you attend it. Now, here's the thing, the advice I've always given people is to attend these courses and things in person, um, because I think you just learn so much more. Plus it gives you an opportunity to network. Um, but recently, you know, over the last, what, 18 months, our people that are getting licensed have not really had that opportunity and they're doing uh, computer learning, uh, which is fine too. It's just something that's a totally different feel. Um, and for me, because there's so many hours, eight hours a day on that course, you know, of course on the computer, you can take longer, but you also need to retain the info pretty quickly because the test comes. And if you've been studying for a month, you know, you're stretching your timeline out. It's easy to forget some of that stuff. But uh, so that's kind of the licensing. And then once you get your license, really, that's just the beginning of it. Um, the 
Uh, I think learning on the job is the best thing to do, but the licensing step one. And then from there, I do think it's important to continue your education and get some of these accreditations. Um, not so much like, especially from, I don't know that it helps you sell to the public. Like sometimes I think there's a green builder accreditation I, or there used to be, it seemed like, uh, I know there is for real estate. Um, I don't know that the public reads a lot into that, but it's very beneficial uh, for me to learn and sit in those classrooms and learn, uh, you know, different disciplines within the industry. So. I think they definitely do pay attention to that right now. It's a huge social thing that's happening. Uh, but one of the things that you had mentioned, you said you think that on the job training is the best. Do you guys do that? Do you guys have internships? Have you went through internships? Do you suggest that to people? How, let's talk about that. Yeah, so we have internship. We have an intern right now in our office. And this is the first year that we've done this program. And so we're kind of learning on the fly, but we're, you know, and there's only so many things that you can do as an unlicensed person. So we have to limit their interaction with the public. But I think just being around and kind of absorbing and seeing how an office works and kind of learning the trade. But like I said, from the start, I rode in the truck my first year in this industry trying to learn everything. So I think there's some benefit to that. And then we've had her doing some, uh, you know, really specific tasks. Um, and But one of the fun things that we did is we had a, a holiday party and she got to be involved in that, which includes inviting people, social media advertisement for it. Um, the list goes on and on and then actually performing the function, which is uh, harder than you think hosting an event, you know, so. On the, on the commercial side, internships are huge. I, I guess I'll speak at a pretty a general level to encompass many of the companies that I've worked with and for. Uh, larger firms have a very structured intern program that begins uh, maybe as early as high school or freshman year in college and, and progressively uh, works with the goal of, of hiring someone, right? So uh, there are companies that if you're invited back for a third intern summer, that's an indicator that you're someone that they would be looking to hire when you graduate. So those understanding the kind of intern programs that exist, uh, understanding what kind of businesses you might be interested in joining long-term and then looking to step into those kind of internship roles, I think are really important. Uh, I, I know that uh, the roles can be very different. As, as Brian mentioned, there are some uh, safety guidelines that limit the age of folks that can actually go out into the construction um, zone itself into the active working area, but that doesn't mean that there aren't early opportunities to learn the business. Uh, my uh, experience started out as a drafter and understanding how the drawings go together and where to find information in the drawing set is still one of the most valuable tools that I have in my toolbox to understand how to solve a problem when we get into the, the final stages of construction, because uh, without that knowledge, I'd be asking a whole bunch of people, how did this happen? Where's the information? What, what was the gap? Uh, so those are the kind of opportunities I would encourage folks to look for is what, what's of interest? Where do you think you might go long term? And then understand what those internship programs might bring you in terms of a long term career path. That's amazing. I, I love um, that students are getting more opportunities these days to do those internships, to have those shadowing opportunities. Um, I think they're so important as they, you know, work on figuring out where they want to go and what direction they want to take their career. So much easier for you to figure out what you don't want to do. You can always do anything, right? Um, so just a quick reminder to the audience, please feel free, to, there's a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to pop in specific questions for Brian or Tiffany. Um, we do welcome them. It also gives me an opportunity to talk less, right? So please, 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 um, you know, send us a few questions. Um, and then is there anything that you guys just want to tell the audience about what you do and, and kind of what you love, or if you have advice for someone who's looking to go into your career right now, do you guys have any, like, if you could share well, that with us? I'll just to finish up on the 
or another ad to add one more thing to the internship discussion. Uh, we've got a, something in our office. It's called the mentorship program. So I really like it. My, our broker just implemented it. And so I think this is, you know, across industries. I think this is important. If you can latch on to somebody in your industry that has some experience and say, hey, I'm your mentee, or I know there are some official, uh, like in the commercial trades, uh, you're going to be an apprentice. Um, but I just think that's so important. So for instance, in our office, if you become a new real estate agent, your first five transactions uh, have to be with a mentor. And so, but that so far, that has been an incredible thing for each involved because uh, the mentee, the new agent gets the benefit of an experienced agent right off the bat, has them in their pocket. And then the mentor is sort of energized by this, right? Because now they've got somebody, sometimes we can get a little bit uh, burnt out, you know, but now we've got all this new energy and it's really creating some neat uh, opportunities for both that we kind of didn't expect. We kind of thought that the mentors might moan and groan and all this, and uh, but actually it's kind of worked in the opposite where the mentors are now feeling energized. And so I just like that. And so if we can find people in our lives that can mentor us, I think there's a great benefit to it. Yeah, I would just also add that uh, early career folks should not be hesitant to call someone up and say, I'm really interested in your career, your business, how you got there. Uh, I may or may not have followed you a little on social media, and I would like to learn from you. Uh, so as Brian pointed out, uh, to have someone call you up or reach out and, and give you that kind of, uh, of uh, a professional co uh, compliment is, is fun to receive, but it also reminds those of us that have been in the industry for a long time that we have something to share and that there's someone who might want to hear what we have to say. Um, that's, that's really important. That's yeah. one thing I learned through this mentorship because you can start to think, oh, I don't know, but you go, wow, well, I do know something. <laughs> 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 I've got something to share. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's also a good place uh, to help early career folks understand that a whole bunch of stuff is going to go <clears throat> wrong. Uh, in our industry, a whole bunch of stuff is going to go wrong and it is never the end of the world. Uh, and so you, you pick up, uh, you take that and you put it in your lessons learned file and you move on. But just being there to give that, that early career person the, the hand up when, when they feel like, I can't believe this happened on my project or uh, in, my, in my job uh, to move on is, is really important. I, I would, uh, this is maybe where I wanna to touch on something I mentioned earlier, which is my windy path into my career. I actually, uh, very in a very backhanded way, stumbled into the opportunity to work on contract for about 10 years. And so while many of my uh, uh, college friends went to work at a firm and stayed there for a long time, I worked for 12 different uh, firms from Texas to Wisconsin over the course of 10 years. Uh, so I learned uh, a ton about the way different organizations operated, the way different parts of the industry uh, contributed to the end goal, a lot of different personalities in terms of leaders and architects and engineers and construction managers. And that I think really formed the way I approach work and work teams now. I have a very broad expectation or, or maybe experience to, to um, balance things against and that has, has done really well for me. So I try to encourage early career people to think about uh, as many different ways to do their work as possible. And I think the pandemic has definitely solidified even remote opportunities more so than maybe we would have at this point. Um, so not every job has to be at a desk every day or with the same company every day forever. And if there's something about your life that you really enjoy and you can marry that with a way to do your work uh, that can actually increase your overall happiness mode uh, we don't have to always do things in a very rigid normal way uh, that that's something i try to share as often as possible yeah i think that's a great point tiffany as i look back on my career sort of winding as well um, and I would encourage people to try different things, just like you're saying. Uh, in 2010, during the recession, 
I had a new family with some kids at home and there weren't many homes to build or sell. And so I was pretty stressed. And so I decided, well, let me try my hand in the corporate world. So I went and did that for uh, about two years. And I'm thankful for the opportunity. It helped my family survive during that time. And, uh, but it also really showed me that I, and it was for me, just personally didn't want to be there. So that for me was a driving force to say, hey, get back to what you wanted to do, what you set out to do, and be brave enough to do it, right? So there's some risk calculation there. And um, it's all it all feels really heavy at the time, but I think it's important to say, hey, this is just our life, so let's create the life that we want. And sometimes that takes trying a few different things, so. Yep, yeah, I think. We don't necessarily say that often enough, particularly in in the uh, let's build a resume and a cover letter and go to a job interview conversation. We probably don't encourage enough creativity. Um, the the one last thing that I'll add at this in this part of the conversation, which uh, again I'm very passionate about, is uh, the the college route and the education route is not the only way to do what we do. I am a huge cheerleader for the skilled trades and there is a path to becoming a construction manager and a project manager and a, and a leader in this industry through the skilled trades. Uh, so if that's something that you enjoy, if you're a very hands-on person, that's a, a great career pathway and there's uh, the sky's the limit if you come through that as well. Absolutely, and to piggyback on that, there is a, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows this, but there is such a need right now such a need they're starving for labor and a lot of them start out with good pay and honestly so the people i've met in my industry the ones that are in the best financial position came through the skilled trades and have worked there you know 20 30 years and then most of them have come into some sort of uh, ownership uh, position okay so there's ways to uh, work yourself up in those skilled trades, if that's what you choose to do, where you don't have to. There's plenty of guys that stayed right there, plumbing houses, they love it, and they get to enjoy the outdoors and they make a good living doing it, so. Love that, thank you so much for the plug for the skilled trades and why they're so important. Um, I know that's something that, uh, you know, as our association, we're working with builders, developers, um, subcontractors, and they're just starving for workers right now. Uh, so it's super important. The one last thing that I want to address before we go, um, you guys both, I love that you both kind of talked about that you took kind of a windy path to get to where you are right now. Um, and so one of the things that I think it takes is transferable skills. Um, and, you know, the I would love for you guys to talk about the importance um, to the kiddos and to the, the people watching about transferable skills that will help you as you're building and working through that windy path of where you want to lead and end up? I think earlier I had mentioned that being organized is important because what we do is very disorganized. And so there's a little bit of managing the chaos that comes with being an organized person in construction. Uh, I think Brian touched on uh, the fact that there's a lot of software out there that's probably an understatement. There isn't anything that we do that isn't driven by some sort of, of computer oriented um, system, be it a budget tracking, a schedule tracking, or just plain communicating. Uh, so even just um, practicing plain old communication skills in a written form, not everyone has to be uh, magic at that, but I don't know of any jobs that you're not going to have to send at least one email a day uh, to someone to convey information. I think uh, that basic comfort level with computers, which may be essentially a, a basic uh, thing that everyone has now, but I, that's important to, to be comfortable working with um, at least some basic computer platforms. And uh, a little bit of interpersonal skills uh, is important for everyone. And depending on your role and how much you interact with the customer or an investor or some decision maker, your interpersonal communication skills will become a, more of a substantial part of your daily activities and your role. But it's still important to be able to work with other people and do that well and make sure that uh, going to, to work every day is, is still fun. 
Uh, so those are some things that, that come to my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I was going to think, because we've talked about it a little bit, we've hit on it, is uh, the communication, like you just said. And as I think about it, almost every friction point uh, in my career could be alleviated with a little more communication, right? And so a lot of that starts with setting expectations. So one thing we like to do is before each different phase of the sales process or the construction process is we've generally done some sort of discussion about it you know, up front or before we go to contract for somebody to build this home, we kind of talk them through. But then through each different phase, I think it's important to uh, readdress those things. So we know, okay, this is how this goes. And that just helps people feel like you're with them, right? Like you're on their team or part of their team. So I think that's really important, the communication and setting expectations. And that can be done, um, Everybody has a different style, but it can be done orally or through email or text or all of the above. It just depends um, what we're doing there. And then, um, like you said, so some of that too is social, like just having the ability and the confidence to talk to people. Um, I think that's really important and that served me well. Um, and it doesn't come natural to me, like I was sort of a shy person, you know, but you grow, the more experience that you get, the more confidence you get. And then people start responding to that. So as much practice as you can get, getting in front of people and speaking, I think is a good thing. So. Okay. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I believe that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, Brian and Tiffany, for taking the time to share your passion with us um, and about you know the road that you've taken to get to where you are. We just appreciate it so much. And I hope that the audience enjoyed hearing about what you guys do. And you know, you're one of the thousands of careers that they can choose from here in Kansas City. Um, and so anything that we can do to promote that and talk about that, um, you know, is always an amazing and, and helpful thing to those that are looking at uh, building their future. So uh, please be sure to take a minute or two to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen after the session ends. This will help us ensure that we are bringing you helpful and relevant content. Um, to find more information on educational programs or career opportunities related to our industry discussed today, um, please be sure to visit www.nebaworkskc.org. Be sure to register for more Career Speaker Series events on our website, and I hope that you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.